Please be seated. Well, that was great, wasn't it? Exciting just to be able to be here with you men. I so appreciate uh, the opportunity. And I just feel like we need to just stop and acknowledge um, our great God together. Would you pray with me? Lord, you are truly, truly worthy of all glory and honor, praise for who you are, a great God who rules all things, who upholds all things, who decrees all things, and who has displayed his glory in the revelation of Jesus Christ who came to this earth, who lived in a human body so that he could die in order for us to be redeemed. You deserve all glory and honor and praise for what you do. And we thank you that you have called and commissioned us to take this incredible message to a world that is lost and in need, a world that is without Christ and without hope. Would you do your work in our hearts that we might be a people who take this mission seriously. For the name and the glory and the praise of Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Wow, that was just a, a real blessing uh, to me. And uh, so glad that you're here. just want to say, uh, Dave, thanks for just the love that you have for the church and the heart that you have for men and for hosting this conference for so many years, and I appreciate that so much, and you just seemed like Oprah, the way that you give out stuff, so <laughs> I was hoping that I could be the oldest one here, not this year, and I just want to also express uh, appreciation on behalf of all these men to those of you from Flint Hills Bible Church who are serving us so well, and uh, we are just really, really appreciative of that, Yes. And I want to thank you men for coming. Without you being here, um, there would be no Iron Men Summit. <clears throat> so I want to ask you a question. Uh, why, are, why are you here? Not why are you here at the Iron Men's Summit. Why are you here on this planet? Why are you here? I mean, think about it. If God rescued you from hell and then granted you eternal life, why didn't he just take you home to be with him in heaven the moment that you got saved? What was it so that you could live your best life now? Did he leave you here so that you could achieve the American dream or that you could secure a comfortable retirement? Well, maybe God left you here so that you could be conformed to the image of Christ. That seems like a, a better answer. But I don't think that is the reason why he left you here. Because in heaven, you will be glorified and you will be like Christ perfectly. He didn't need to leave you here to accomplish that. Okay, well, then maybe God left you here to worship him. Worship is definitely a significant part of what we do in this life, but I don't think that's why God left us here, is because we will be worshiping him forever in heaven, and we're going to do it perfectly. Okay, well, then maybe God left you here to glorify him. Well, that's, I think, closer, because in the ultimate sense, you were left here to glorify God, but... That is not why you are here, because in heaven, 
you will be glorifying God forever. So you are here to glorify God, but it is in a way that you simply can't in heaven. So the reason why God has us here has to be more than to just conform us to the image of Christ. It has to be more than just the activity of worship. And it must be to glorify God in a specific way that we won't be able to in heaven. The reason that we are still here is because God has commissioned us with a task to perform. He has assigned us with a responsibility to fulfill. He has given us a mission to accomplish that we simply can't do and won't do in heaven. You see, the chief means by which God is glorified in this world is redeeming a people from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And he has chosen to accomplish that purpose through you and me as we proclaim the good news of the gospel. You see, while we are here on this earth, we are his ambassadors who represent him in the world. We are his witnesses who testify of him to the world, and we are his co-laborers who serve him in the world. And since all of these things, or none of these things, will be done in heaven, this is why we're here in the world. I want to invite you to open your Bibles to the first letter that Peter wrote. In the second chapter, 1 Peter 2.9, this is, as Dave mentioned earlier, the theme verse for this year's Iron Men's Summit. 1 Peter 2 verse 9 indicates that we are a distinct people with a distinct purpose. It tells us that God has made us who we are in order to tell the world who He is. Follow along as I read. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So God has made us who we are so that we can tell the world who he is. He has made us who we are so that we can make him known. And the way we make him known, according to this verse, is by proclaiming his excellencies. So our mission involves proclaiming a powerful message from a powerful God who powerfully saves. Just a little bit of background about 1 Peter before we start sort of observing some of the elements in this verse. It was the summer of 64 AD and the city of Rome burnt to the ground. The citizens of Rome assumed that because Nero, the emperor, wanted to build Rome into a a modern city, that he was actually the one who was responsible for the fire. And so Nero needed a scapegoat. And he found one in the growing number of Christians who were living throughout the Roman Empire. And to shift the blame from himself, Nero spread the rumor that the fire was started by Christians. They were responsible. And he then launched a season of intense persecution against the church throughout the world. And Peter wrote this letter from Rome one year after the fire broke out in 65 AD. And in this letter, he wanted to offer hope. He wanted to provide perspective and to give direction for Christians who were beginning to to experience the intense suffering of persecution. He reminded them that their true homeland 
wasn't here. It was heaven. And that they were scattered throughout the world as foreigners, as, as pilgrims, as aliens in a hostile world. And he stressed that suffering was actually the means by which they could bring glory to God as they reflected him and declared his gospel to a fallen world. Well, as we come to 1 Peter 2.9, Peter identifies in this verse who we are in Christ and what we are to do in the world. The message is very straightforward. The message is God has made us who we are to tell the world who he is. Now, there's two observations from this verse that I want to consider as it relates to our mission. The first observation is about our perspective for the vision. In the first part of the verse, Peter demonstrates that our corporate identity is the perspective for the mission. Now, Peter's emphasis in this verse is the mission. But before he identifies that mission, he spends some time reminding us of who we are. You see, understanding our identity is what gives us perspective, the perspective that we need to fulfill the mission he's called us to. Now, when God saved you, and I'm assuming that we have a large number of believers that are here. Some of you are not. And I'm excited for you. Because you are going to get a sense of God's heart for people like you who don't know him. But for those who are saved, when God saved you, something happened in your life that fundamentally changed your identity. It changed who you are. Let me just give you a few of the things that God did when you were saved. When God saved you, first, he removed all condemnation. He delivered you from the kingdom of Satan. He forgave you of your sins. He reconciled you to himself. He redeemed you. He regenerated you. You were made a new creation. You were adopted into God's family. You became a member of the household of God. God gave you an inheritance. At that moment, God granted you eternal life. He transferred you into his kingdom. God justified you. That moment, God imputed Christ's righteousness to you, and you were made acceptable to God. You were sanctified positionally in God. You were perfected in God forever, and you were qualified by God for heaven. At that moment, God made you the object of his care. At that moment, God united you to himself. He made you a member of his body. He made you a, a branch in his vine. He made you a stone in his building. He made you a sheep in his flock. He made you part of his bride. God, at that moment, made you a recipient of the ministries of the Holy Spirit. You were born of the Spirit. You were baptized by the Spirit. You were indwelt by the Spirit and sealed by the Spirit, and you were given spiritual gifts. And in 1 Peter 2, 9, the moment you were saved, we see that God made you a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and a people for God's own possession. And it is in that statement that Peter shows how our identity gives us perspective for the mission. Now, Peter begins at verse 9 with these words. But you are. You see it? The word but signals that Peter is making a contrast to something. He just stated earlier in this chapter that Jesus is the living stone who was rejected. He said that unbelievers stumble over him because of disobedience. And then Peter says immediately after that, but not you, but not you. He says, you don't stumble 
You don't stumble because you are the people of God. You are the people God has chosen to fulfill his purpose in the world. Now, it's significant here that the word you goes beyond who you are as an individual. This is not the singular you. This you refers to who we are corporately as the church of God. So the emphasis in this verse is not so much our identity individually as much as it is about our identity corporately. You see, corporately, we are the people of God. So whether you are a believing Jew or a believing Gentile, whether you are a believing Hungarian or American or Mexican or African or Russian, if you are in Christ, we're family. We're family. You see, our identity is not based on our ethnicity. It's not based on our nationality. It's not based on our background or our social status. It's not even based on our politics. Our identity is based on who we are in our relationship to Jesus Christ. See, when God redeemed you, he not only brought you into an eternal relationship with himself, he also connected you to a vast spiritual family called the church. And this family of God is visibly reflected all over the world in pockets of believers just like the churches that are represented here. So the expressions that Peter uses to describe our identity are all corporate concepts. This is not a solo mission. This is a mission that's assigned to the church. It's assigned to your church. It's assigned to your church. It's assigned to my church. So what is our corporate identity according to this verse? Well, first, notice, regarding our identity, that we are a chosen people. We are a chosen people. Now, speaking here of the body of Christ corporately, Peter states, but you are a chosen race. Now, he's not referring to something here that, that we did, to a choice that we made in order to get into God's family. Now, he is referring to God's choice. We corporately are a chosen race. And the fact that God has chosen us and brought us into a saving relationship with himself is a staggering truth. But Peter's emphasis here isn't so much that he chose us individually. He did. It's that he chose us collectively to be members of God's household. What this means is that we are united together as God's chosen family. See, the family of God is a chosen race. And while the word race refers to who we are spiritually, we often think of the word race to refer to our natural heritage. Like this is from my line. I'm from Hungarian descent, so I'm of that race, a European ancestry kind of race, but that's not how Peter's using the word race. He's not using it to refer to who we are on the basis of our natural heritage. He uses it to refer to who we are as a people united by a common spiritual heritage, a spiritual heritage that we gained at the new birth. You see, we became part of the human race through physical birth, but we became part of God's chosen race through spiritual birth. We are who we are as the people of God because of God's choice. But what does this have to do with the mission? What does this have to do with the mission? Listen, God's elective choice is a truth that provides motivation for the mission. Why? 
It is because God has determined that the means for reaching the people he has chosen is the gospel. We are a people chosen by God to take the gospel to the world so that through the gospel, God will bring others he has chosen into the family. But not only are we a chosen people, secondly, we are a commissioned people. Peter says we're a chosen race, and then he says that we are a royal priesthood. Now, as a royal priesthood, we have been commissioned by the king to serve in his kingdom as priests. The concept of a royal priesthood is actually drawn from Exodus 19.6. In fact, all of these pictures are taken from the Old Testament. We're not spending a lot of time just diving into the history but this is what Israel was to be. They were to be a nation of priests to God. And what God said of Israel under the old covenant, he is saying here of believers under the new covenant. You see, the church, your church, my church, the church collectively is comprised of priests who serve God. Four verses earlier, look at what Peter said in verse 5. He said, you, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. Now, why? Notice, it is to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. What sacrifices do we offer up? Definitely not animal sacrifices. Jesus sacrificed himself once for all. Now, as priests, we offer the sacrifice of lives that humbly submit to God by fulfilling what he has given us to do. We serve him as commissioned priests. So what does being a royal priesthood have to do with this mission? Well, it means that we have been commissioned by our king to offer the spiritual service to the king of making disciples. That's what royal priests do. So who are we? What is our corporate identity? We are a people who are chosen and a people who are commissioned. And then third, notice we are a people who are consecrated. We are a consecrated people. Not only are we a chosen race and a royal priesthood, we're also a holy nation. Now, the word nation refers to people who are under the same ruler and who operate under the same laws. We are not a nation in the political sense. The church is not a nation in the sense that we are political. We are a nation in a spiritual sense. You see, our citizenship is in heaven, not here. Our ruler is Jesus. But notice that it's not simply that we are a spiritual nation of believers. We are a spiritual nation of believers, here's the point, who are holy. Who are holy. What this means is that we have been set apart by God. We've been consecrated. We have been made to be distinct from the world. Everything about the church is different. Everything about your life is different. Our standing before God is different. Our direction in life is different. Our values are different. Our attitudes are different. Our pursuits are different. Our priorities are different. Our very lives are different. Why? It's because in Christ we are holy. We are consecrated. We are set apart for God and his purposes. Well, what does this have to do with the mission? Well, when the world looks at the church, they should be able to see something that is radically different than what it sees in itself. Who we are as expressed in how we live actually gives credibility to the mission. 
as a holy nation of believers, the church is not to blend into the world. We are to stand out. We're not to hide. We are to shine. I see two extremes characterizing the church today. One is an isolation from the world, a kind of a kind of spiritual segregation from those who need the redemption, redemptive message that we are called to bring. The other is an amalgamation into the world, a kind of spiritual saturation of the world's philosophies and, and values and ideals and attitudes and priorities. But we've been called to neither. Philippians 2.15 says that we are to be children of God without blemish in the midst of a, of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. We are to be brilliant light and pungent salt in a dark and decaying world. So what is our corporate identity? We are a, a chosen people. We are a commissioned people and we are a consecrated people. Finally, notice Peter says we are a cherished people. He says that we are a people for his own possession. What this means is that we belong exclusively to God as his cherished possession. You know, it's true that we all belong to God individually because we were bought at a great price, the, the blood of God's Son. But Peter here is stressing that the church corporately is God's possession. Jesus is the head of the church. God owns the church. In Acts 20, verse 28, it says that God obtained the church with his own blood. This is what makes us God's people. In the very next verse, in 1 Peter 2.10, notice he says, Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. See, as the people of God, we are God's cherished possession. Now, this concept of identity would have been exhilarating for Peter's original audience. You see, they were hated by the world, and they were being mocked, and they were being abused and rejected. Persecution was starting to, to happen throughout Asia Minor, where these believers were scattered, which is Turkey today. But Peter said... You may be persecuted by the world, but you're treasured by God. He owns you, and he loves you. You see, God's love for the church is incomprehensible. Christ died for the church. You see, there's nothing about us that makes us lovable, and yet God loves and cherishes us as his own possession. Well, what is this? have to do with the mission. I think it tells us that as a people for God's own possession, we are not our own. We've been bought at a price. It means that we belong to him. So our agenda is his. We're under his management, and we are to do what he's given us to do. We are the people of God who've been chosen by God to serve God as those who are possessed by God. This identity gives us the perspective that we need for the mission. Actually, it doesn't give us any room to say, yeah, you know, this really isn't that important to me. The fact that it's important to God should make it important to you. The fact that this is what God has left you here to do should put that sense of moral ought squarely in your heart. But notice in the second half of the verse, there's another observation that I want you to consider. Not only does our corporate identity give the perspective for the mission, secondly, our corporate responsibility 
is the privilege of the mission. Our corporate responsibility is the privilege of the mission. Look at the verse again. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Why? Notice the second part of the verse. Peter says, it is so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. See, we're not brought into God's family. We're not given this incredible corporate identity just so that we can go off and do our own thing. No, we were brought into God's family to fulfill the mission that he's left us here to accomplish. Now, there's four privileges involved in this responsibility to carry out the mission. What are they? Well, one privilege of the mission involves us fulfilling God's purpose. We actually get to fulfill God's purpose as we engage in the mission. We've been Brought into this corporate identity for a purpose. Peter says, notice this, it is so that you may. Now the word that is from the Greek construction which introduces a purpose clause. And Peter's point here is that God has chosen his people for a very specific purpose. The reality of who we are, our corporate identity, positions us to do something very specific that God intends us to do. And as we will see, what God intends for us to do is to make him known in the world by making disciples and telling people the gospel. This was actually God's intended purpose for Israel. In Exodus 9, 16, God says to the people, after they have come out of Egypt, he says, but for this purpose, I have raised you up to show you my power so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. How did Israel do? It failed. But just as God raised up Israel to proclaim his name in the world, he has called us as the church to do the same. So our mission involves the privilege of fulfilling God's purpose. I mean, think about it. We actually get to do what God wants done in the world. We have the privilege of representing him in the world as a corporate people of God so that we can fulfill his purpose. A second privilege of the mission involves verbalizing God's message. It involves verbalizing God's message. Message. Why has God brought us into his family as the people of God? Notice, it is so that you may proclaim. Now, the Greek verb for proclaim means to tell, it means to announce, to declare, to report, to advertise, to make something known that previously was unknown. So the mission has a verbal element to it. The means through which these believers actually became the people of God was through the verbal proclamation of others. In fact, in chapter 1, verse 12, Peter said that the good news had been announced to them. In chapter 1, verse 25, he said it had been preached to them. And now, Peter says that they are to do the same thing so that others can become part of God's family too. Now, verbally proclaiming is the responsibility of every person who is in Christ. In other words, it's not just the mission of your pastor. It's not just the mission of one particular church that just happens to be very evangelistic. No, this is your mission. This is our mission. 
Have you ever heard the phrase, preach the gospel, if necessary, use words? Well, that's dumb. That's dumb because the gospel is something that is to be verbally proclaimed. I understand the sentiment. The sentiment is live a life that backs up the gospel, but nobody is ever going to fall on their face in repentance because of what they see in your life. They need to hear the life-changing message of the gospel. See, the mission involves proclaiming something. But what are we to proclaim? What are we to proclaim? Notice a third privilege of the mission involves announcing God's excellencies. You see, what we are to specifically proclaim is identified here as the excellencies of Him. Now, the word excellencies refers to something in its perfections. It describes the quality that makes something stand out because of what it does. For instance, to give you an illustration, a rusty, dull knife is not an excellent knife. But a sharp knife is excellent because it does what it's supposed to do. It cuts. That's the idea here. So what excellencies does Peter have in mind that we are to proclaim? If that's the mission... If we are to proclaim the excellencies of him, what does Peter have in mind? These are the excellencies of God's glory which are put on display in his work of salvation. You see, this has been Peter's focus so far in this letter. When we proclaim, men, when we proclaim the excellencies of God... We are proclaiming what God does through the gospel. We're proclaiming God's work of salvation. We proclaim the excellencies, for instance, of God's power that regenerates spiritually dead sinners. We proclaim the excellencies of God's mercy that forgives spiritually guilty sinners. We proclaim the excellencies of God's grace that saves spiritually lost sinners. We proclaim the excellencies of God's love that redeems spiritually bound sinners. And we proclaim the excellencies of God's justice which condemns sinners who reject him. These are the excellencies that are on display through the gospel of God. You see, in the gospel, Romans 1 says, the righteousness of God is revealed. So why are we here? Well, God has made us who we are to tell the world who he is. And we do this by proclaiming his excellencies, the excellencies that are intrinsic in the gospel. God calls us to this mission because the gospel is the means through which God saves sinners. The gospel is the power of God to salvation for whoever believes. This means that the gospel has the power to save every kind of sinner regardless of ethnicity or education or age or income or nationality or family background. It has the power to save the most radicalized Muslim, the most religious Catholic, or the most self-deceived Baptist. The gospel has the power to save upstanding law-abiding citizens and deranged mass-murdering terrorists. The gospel has the power to save soccer moms and abortionists. It has the power to save celibate singles and married adulterers. The gospel has the power to save university professors and high school dropouts. It has the power to save immoral homosexuals and moral heterosexuals. It has the power to save rich sinners who are steeped in materialism. And it has the power to save poor sinners who are homeless. 
there is power in the message that we are to proclaim in our mission. You see, the gospel is able to make spiritually dead people alive, and it's able to help or cause spiritually blind people to see. In fact, in Acts 26, verse 18, Jesus appeared to Paul and said, I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from their darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins. That's our mission. And that's God's work in salvation. And he accomplishes it through the gospel that we proclaim. Men, that's our mission. Not only does this mission involve the privilege of fulfilling God's purpose, of verbalizing God's message and announcing God's excellencies, finally notice it involves the privilege of exalting God's work. Because at the end of verse 9, it says we are to proclaim the excellencies of him, notice, who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, this isn't just describing what God did in our lives. That's enough. I mean, the fact that God called us out of darkness and transferred us into his marvelous light is enough. But Peter is really connecting this to what we are to proclaim. It's the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. So it identifies what God does in the life of everyone he saves through the gospel. And what is that? It is to call them out of darkness. As we proclaim the gospel... God will do that in the lives of others. We need to have the confidence that God actually, truly, really does save people. We need to be confident that the Spirit of God is still alive, regenerating lost, dead sinners. So the mission isn't about exalting what we do. It's not about our methodologies or about how clever we are or about how we can manipulate people into making a decision. No, it is about exalting what God does through the gospel. And what does he do? What does he, do? he calls people out. Not one person in the history of mankind has ever been able to bring themselves out of darkness. You know Why? Because darkness is not what is around men. Darkness is what is in men. Darkness describes the hopeless condition of every person who is without Jesus Christ. You see, man's fundamental problem is that he is totally corrupted by sin. And there's absolutely nothing that he can do, that anyone can do, to avoid the righteous judgment that awaits him in hell. However, God has provided a way. Through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, God forgives sinners, he saves sinners, and he declares sinners righteous. This is what the gospel message proclaims. So our mission simply involves declaring the gospel and watching God work. You see, through the power of the gospel, God makes spiritually blind people see. Through the power of the gospel, God sets spiritually bound people free. Through the power of the gospel, God forgives people who are spiritually bankrupt. So how did we come out of this hopeless condition of darkness. Peter says God called us out. Well, how? We heard the gospel message, and through the work of the Spirit operating through the gospel, we were called out of darkness into his marvelous light. So the work was God's. I tell you, it is so liberating to know that the mission we are given doesn't require us to save anyone. 
because we can't save anyone. We just need to give people the good news of the gospel. And God does the work, and God saves the lost. We need to, you know, in the parable of the sowers in Matthew 4, we just need to get the seed out of the bag. Throw seed wherever it can, can be sown. And let God use the seed to do the work to bring regenerate life. What an amazing mission. What a great privilege. As those who have been called out of darkness were to penetrate the world with the gospel. And God in the process calls people out of darkness. And as we fulfill this mission... This mission is undergirded with divine authority. If you remember, just before Jesus ascended to heaven, he declared, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And then he said this, now you go and make disciples of all nations. So our mission has the incredible authority of Jesus behind it, which means nothing can stop it. You see, because Jesus has all authority over nations and governments, no legislative action can ever shut down our mission. Because Jesus has authority over every industry and every business and every economy, no financial crisis will ever thwart our mission. Because Jesus has authority over every bacteria and every virus and every germ, no disease can ever kill our mission. Because Jesus has authority over every person, no individual can ever defeat the mission. And because Jesus has authority over Satan, no spiritual force can ever terminate our mission. As those who have been called out of darkness into his light, we are to declare a message of unfathomable power that offers the hope of salvation to the world. Our mission is not about making pagans religious or making poor people rich or making sick people well or making liberals conservative. Our mission is to make disciples by declaring the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. So men, come out of hibernation as God's chosen family. Come out of hibernation as God's commissioned servants. Come out of hibernation as God's consecrated people. Come out of hibernation as God's cherished possession. And fulfill your mission and proclaim the good news of God's excellencies through the gospel. Why? Why? Because God has made you who you are to tell the world who he is. Is. Amen? Amen? What a great mission. And I'm so excited for today for these men to be challenged regarding various aspects of this. I'm looking forward to hearing truth from you. Thank you, God, for your amazing work in our lives, for bringing us into the body of Christ, for saving us, and giving us a job to do. What a privilege. What a blessing. We actually have the privilege of being involved in seeing dead people come to life through the gospel. Help us to be like an old garden hose who just is that channel and lets the water of the word do the work. God, may you be glorified as we impact our world with the gospel for your glory. And we look forward to heaven. To all of the worship and praise and glory we will give you because of what was accomplished through the gospel in our mission now. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 I don't know about you, but I'm ready to run through a wall. Right? Mike, that was awesome. Thank you for setting the tone.